I think the reason why people have continued approaching me on issues of game design arises from the fact that I say what people in their guts know is right, even though they don't like hearing it. I've often been called the conscience of the games industry or whatever. Uh, but the fact is, I say unpleasant things that many other people in the games industry secretly know are true, but they don't like saying them out loud. And uh, I have reached a position where I'm immune to the criticism that attends saying such things. So I can, I can get away with, with saying them. Uh, I have been such a harsh critic of the industry that I've attracted a great deal of uh, rancor. But, uh, uh, I don't know, I bring a point of view to my commentary that uh, I don't think is, is uh, presented by anybody else. I, I'm taking a very different approach. Instead of where other people start off saying, what sells? How can we figure out what sells? I go back to you know, deep fundamentals. I've been thinking about the role of language, cognitive science, human cognitive evolution, and so forth, issues like this, uh, for, for decades. Uh, you know, why do animals play? Where, where does play come from? Uh, these are really fundamental issues, and I've been, I've been poking around with these problems for decades. Uh, I'm just glad that other people are finally starting to think about them. Is there anything in games that you think they're capable of that we just haven't seen yet? Like oh. something that's coming out? Oh, yes. Games have scratched the surface. Game designers have not even begun to address the potential of the medium. Uh, the primary reason why is that uh, game designers have not addressed the problem I cited 23 years ago, people, not things. Games should be about people. And they aren't. They're about objects, things. Uh, you chase things, you shoot things, you acquire things, you gobble things, you run from things, but it's, it's always things. And games need to address human concerns. And uh, until they do that, they're going to remain of little real significance. Uh, and I've been hammering at this point for decades, and that has earned me the ire of a great many game designers because, in fact, it's a very difficult problem. Uh, people are immensely more complicated than guns or bullets or <laughs> this kind of thing. Uh, and so writing or designing games that address these issues is a much tougher problem. But it can be done. Uh, this is a much tougher problem. But it can be done. Uh, I was scratching at the surface of this as early as 1983 with a game called Excalibur. I did the first game before Excalibur. I did a game called Gossip, which was the first game about strictly interpersonal relationships, about people gossiping about each other. It was absurdly, ridiculously simple-minded, but it opened a door that nobody else ever bothered to walk through, and I continued to develop it. I still remember a game I did back around 88 or so, and uh, the editor had a review. The editor of a magazine had a review that panned the game, and uh, I... He called me up to ask me, you know, can you tell me anything nice about the game that you think is important? And I, I pointed out that there were some very interesting interpersonal things going on in the game, and he kind of brushed that off as uh, unimportant. Uh, another game I uh, 
unimportant. Uh, another game I did, uh, same magazine, blew it off saying, well, you know, it isn't fun. And if it's not fun, it's, it's not even useful as a game. Well, this game was about environmental issues. It wasn't supposed to be cutesy fun. It was supposed to be entertaining and educational. And uh, the, I was disgusted by the thought that they would just blow off a game merely because it wasn't fun. Uh, I did a great satire on that. Uh, how did that go? I'm sorry, Ludwig, but your Fifth Symphony, yes, it soars with the majesty of fate and death, but, you know, it just isn't fun. Can't you come up with a jingle or something we can snap our fingers along with? Uh, that was pretty much the attitude of the game's biz, and uh, it still has not begun to address any of those things. I remember many years ago exhorting... Uh, my colleagues, you know, let's let's do games about a boy and his dog, or a prostitute with a heart of gold, or a man facing his 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 manhood on the dusty street of a western town, or you know, a comedy, or a game about divorce, or romance, or betrayal, or any of these things. And uh, I just got a lot of blank stares. You know, how do you make it fun? <laughs> Um, let's see, let me pause, and, uh, okay, sure. One of the things that did in text adventures was the whole text versus graphics thing, and I must confess that I recall a public presentation, I was on a panel with an Infocom guy, and I was at Atari, and I remember uh, tweaking him on exactly that point. Uh, the the problem, though, was really that graphics were so lousy for the uh, the early years of personal computers. It, it was such a problem that graphics became an obsession with everybody. Uh, it was so difficult to get good graphics that good graphics became the standard by which everything was judged. It was sort of... You know, if you uh, raise a rat with no salt in its diet, it's just going to want salt, salt, salt. Uh, we had the same problem with graphics in that everybody just came to assume. It, it became a fundamental value. you got to have fabulous graphics. And this continued to dominate all the thinking in game design until just a few years ago. They are finally starting to feel like satiated with with graphics, but that's one of the things that did in text adventures. Because they had no graphics, people felt that they were necessarily inferior. Uh, I think text adventures could have beaten that if they had really pushed the richness angle, if they'd given people a, a much richer experience, and they could have done that. But... Uh, they didn't, and so they succumbed to the graphics mania that was dominant all through the 80s and most of the 90s as well. It's a great shame. You know, one of the um, things that comes... I've gone back, you know, it's funny. I was like, man, isn't that great? We just went to King's Quest. It looked, you know, I had a fun time. Well, yeah, that was this graphics obsession. Uh, but there was another problem with the text adventures that I don't think the uh, the producers or the creators of these addressed adequately, and that was the parser puzzle problem. Uh, these things were damn frustrating, and in fact, they derived their play value from ridiculous puzzles. I think the... Uh, uh, the classic example was the, uh, what, the gefilte fish, or what, whatever it was. Babelfish. Babelfish, that's right. Uh, uh, that, was, that was simply too obscure a puzzle, and the, the artists were proud of that, and I think they should have been deeply ashamed, because that kind of puzzle is just, it's uh, anti-productive. It, it it destroys the player's confidence. It's um, 
it's just the wrong way to design good interaction. There should be a consistency, a clarity. It should make sense. Uh, and they were going for ever more nonsensical. The problem was they were using puzzles because they had to do black and white Boolean logic. And when you do Boolean logic, it's so simple that you can't put any nuance into it. If they'd made the jump to arithmetic logic, then they could have accomplished so much more. And they never bothered to do that. Uh, great shame. Um. Yeah, I, I played some of the graphic adventures, and I was really disappointed with them. I felt, in terms of overall merit, Infocom stuff completely outclassed the Sierra stuff. Um, and I considered it uh, a great injustice that Sierra was raking in the money while Infocom was struggling. Um, Infocom made some great made some huge mistakes but what Sierra was doing their designs were pedestrian uh, and it it especially bothered me that uh, some of the Sierra designers that the Sierra designs were uh, praised lavishly when they were really quite pedestrian there wasn't anything really impressive or creative about them. They just threw a lot of graphics at it. Um, so, who knows? So, um, so it, it's, not a, it's not so much a case of being anti- I don't want... I have never been very enthusiastic about puzzles because puzzles don't really permit much rich interaction. Basically, either you get it wrong, in which case you're frustrated and confused and angry, or you get it right, in which case you're bored. Uh, puzzles don't really allow you to solve a problem your way, and that's one of the things that's, that's very important about good interactivity. Uh, just as a student has to learn a new concept his way, a player has to win the game his way. That's that's enormously important. Uh, consider uh, a question I like to challenge people with is, uh, so tell me, there of the six, seven billion people on this planet, how do you think you rank in bed? Uh, would you say you are number one, number two, number three? How about number billion? You know, there are... Billions of people who are better than you at anything that you value yourself in. You, you know, you think you're, you think you're a good filmmaker? <laughs> there are thousands and thousands of people who are better than you. So how is it that we are able to conclude that we are something better than worm snot? And the answer is our particular way of doing things. Yes, you may not be as successful as Steven Spielberg, but you produce films like nobody else does. Yours are unique to you, and you take value in that. That's important to you, and that's what we all do with what we do. We do it our way, and we say, my way of doing this is is a good way of doing it. Uh, I like to point to the people, the tourists who take, pictures of the, of the Eiffel Tower. I'm sorry, there are magnificent pictures of the Eiffel Tower that taken by professional photographers. Why would Joe Jerk want to use his, his snapshot camera to take a picture? Well, it's his picture, and that's what's important. In the same way, you have to solve a game your way. You have to bring to bear your particular combination of talents. And a puzzle doesn't admit that. There's a right and a wrong. And the right is the author's version of right. And you have to find his right way of doing it rather than generating your own right way of doing it. And that's why puzzles just aren't as, as good as the richer type of interaction we get that allows some kind of nuance, what I'll call arithmetic 
interaction as opposed to Boolean. A kind of interaction where there are degrees, where you can do it a little better, or a little faster, a little smoother, a little richer, in some way a little better. The, this black and white approach doesn't work very well. And again, that was what held back, has always held back interactive fiction. So just on the general basis of um, anything along that way, I guess, any, any thoughts you have along that subject? The importance of interactivity does not arise from any intrinsic merit. You know, interactivity is, is necessarily good and we've got to be interactive. The value of interactivity arises from the way the human mind responds to it. The human mind is not a passive receptacle. It's an active agent. We don't learn by sitting on our fat butts and listening or watching or hearing or passively receiving information. We learn by reaching out to the world and messing around with it with our fingers. Uh, that's just the way our brains work. Well, you can't be activist with... Uh, the expository media. When you're watching a movie or reading a book or watching a play or whatever, you're just sitting there letting information come in. You're not really turning it over in your hands. That's the value of interactivity. It engages the human brain far more powerfully than, than any of the other media. But it only does so if the designer does a good job with the interactivity. If the interactivity is primitive, then you don't get much engagement. Uh, you, you want to design interactivity that really reaches out and grabs the student. Think of it in terms of, of a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a teacher. Uh, imagine how much you would learn from a teacher who simply talk, 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 lectures at you, and you ask a question, he ignores your question and just continues the lecture. Well, that's, that's not very effective at all. Imagine, by contrast, the ideal teacher who starts off asking you a question and then just proceeds to continue to ask you more questions that develop your thinking on the problem. And lo and behold, at the end of this Socratic dialogue, you have produced the answer out of your own head. The teacher didn't tell you anything. He just evoked the truth from you. Good interactivity is the same way. It should give the the player the greatest opportunity to to be himself, to express himself, to say the things he wants to say that are relevant to whatever message you're trying to communicate. And for that, you need a lot more nuance than certainly than the text adventures give you or even that the games give you. Uh, this is one reason why I've concentrated so much on linguistics. I'm, I'm still uh, surprised that nobody in the field seems to, be, seems to have yet grasped the overwhelming importance of linguistics. If you're going to communicate with people, you have to understand the primary means by which they communicate, which is language. And... I've seen very few attempts to really integrate linguistic concepts into games or, for that matter, in uh, interactive fiction. It's, uh, it's a shame. The, the grammars used in the interactive fiction stuff I've seen are still very primitive. Uh, we could be doing so much more there. So interactivity is important because it meets the needs of the human mind so much better than anything else. And that's why we have to pursue interactivity. Okay. The genre started off with enormous potential. It was very simple at first, just text and branching. But it could have become gigantic because the, the basic structure was so clean and simple, all he needed to do was to add uh, smarter branching to permit uh, a richer kind of behavior. And unfortunately, text adventures never went beyond the simple Boolean branching narrative. Uh, 
that's the great disappointment of that medium. The first thing they should have done was relied more heavily upon arithmetic factors in the branching. In other words, uh, when you come to a, a point in the adventure and you say, well, are we going to do A or B or C? Right now, there's, initially that was done by a very simple yes or no type of thing. Is Has he gotten the key to the door? Uh, has he already told off the wombat? Uh, very simple types of questions that yielded very simple answers. The first step should have been uh, an arithmetic decision-making. Does she like him enough? And, of course, that requires us to keep track of how much she likes him. And that, re in turn, requires arithmetic calculations, equations. And text ad adventures never made that transition, which greatly limited the richness of behavior. Uh, the next step of behavior. Uh, the next step would have been to create the the cause and effect relationships more as uh, what are uh, more as what are called directed graphs than trees. That is, in a tree structure, you start at the beginning and you can do this or this. And if you come to here, you can do that or that. But if you come to here, you can do that or that. And then it just branches and branches and branches. And so the whole thing spreads out looking like a tree. Tree structures are the wrong way to do it. They are too complicated. They very quickly get gigantic. The right solution would have been a system where th the nodes feed back into themselves, where you can reach a given point in the node and the context is changed. And so the node means something different. I'll give you a very simple example. Pac-Man is a directed graph. That is, you move through a maze and you can come back to the same node in the maze many times, and yet each time you come back, it's different because the ghosts are in different locations. Therefore, you can go round and round and round in Pac-Man and keep coming back to the same place over and over and over yet it's still interesting because the context has changed each time. Uh, text adventures don't have a strong sense of context, and so you can't afford to come back to the same place in the text adventure because that gets very repetitive. So those are some of the disappointments I've had with text adventures. They never really climbed out of the, what they had in the early 80s. Were there any text adventures on some vectors? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The early 80s were such an exciting time. I mean, uh, first we had Zork, and then right around 80 and 81, there was just an explosion of activity, a lot of cleverness, and we started seeing some growing richness. And then with Infocom, the whole text adventure genre really just... They did all sorts of wonderful things with that medium. Uh, they really showed its potential. But unfortunately, they were sabot torpedoed by the, the whole graphics obsession. And uh, that's, that's a great shame that, that the whole graphics thing uh, subverted the text adventure, that medium. It still had lots of potential. I think they could have beaten it if they'd pushed hard in the areas, in their strengths, uh, fundamental rule in, uh, in, in all areas where there's competition. In, in the military, you say, fight on the ground of your own choosing, which means if you've got a lot of cavalry, you want to fight the battle in an open plain where the guys can gallop around really easily. And if you've got a lot of artillery, you want to have some hills where you can put the artillery up and, and bombard other people. And if you've got infantry, you want rough ground where the cavalry can't go. So you want to Fight where you're strong, not where you're weak. In business, we say, uh, you know, what's your basis of competitive advantage? What is it about your product that can beat other products? And that's what you got to go with. Uh, Infocom made exactly the wrong decision in trying to go into graphic adventures. Uh, I, I can understand the, the impetus, but the right solution would have been to make text adventures much, much smarter and they didn't do that. So, great disappointment. In terms of improved and how they go about it? 
I think they could have done much better if they'd s l reduced the size of their atoms. That is, the basic atom of interaction in a text adventure is a paragraph of output and a sentence of input. I think they would have done well to break that down smaller and smaller uh, into actual words so that uh, you could they could respond in a way more meaningfully to your input. Uh, uh, that it, it turns out, I've accomplished that with Storytron, but I had to confess it was a lot harder to do than I had anticipated. Still, the text adventure people didn't have any other distractions. They could focus solely on architectural stuff and they didn't really develop that as much. They could have done... There was a whole bunch of interesting experiments I was doing with text back then. I had a system I called Tinker Toy Text, where uh, you could put the words together. Do we want to just wait for this to... Yeah. Okay. You know, you were saying the strengths you were going after with Storytron. Yeah, I, I did that with Storytron, but it turned out to be... a far more difficult problem than I had anticipated. Uh, and, but at the same time, there were a lot of precursor actions that I took back in the mid-80s that the text adventure people could have, should have, been experimenting with. I did a variety of experiments with what I call Tinker Toy Text, where I designed systems where words were stuck together according to grammatical rules. Uh, and believe it or not, uh, the National Enquirer was my inspiration. I remember being in a, a supermarket checkout line and looking at the various headlines. I was with a friend, and I turned to my friend and said, you know, I bet I could write a computer program that would generate headlines for the National Enquirer. All you need is, you know, Elvis and some flying saucers abductions, return from the dead, message of world peace. You know, you just sort of put those bits and pieces together and uh, you, you could generate all sorts of headlines. And I did that. This was in 1984. I actually ended up using a very primitive version of that in Balance of Power. I had a headline generator that uh, uh, generated news stories that reflected the... Uh, the degree of popular discontent in any given country. So uh, uh, it was very easy to do, and I continued developing that idea for, for years. And, and the text adventure people never seemed to, to catch on to that idea. It was a real disappointment. Do you see, um, you know, one of the... It's truly fully interactive. Well, no, not necessarily. A lot of people, I think, misunderstand the nature of interactivity, thinking that it requires giving the player absolute freedom. And uh, that's, that's not at all what interactivity requires. It merely requires giving the player all relevant, useful freedom. And so, in fact, the, the artistic content of an interactive product lies in the choices that the creator makes available to the user. So you don't... And, and this is a hard concept for many artists to, to comprehend because until now all art, all such expressions have been um, what I call expository. I, as artist, simply dump my expression upon you as, as reader, uh, audience, whatever. And uh, the feeling all along was that the audience must not intrude upon the artistic purity of the work of art. Uh, and that's all well and good for all other media, but in the interactive medium, the truth is, lies in the interaction itself. I like to point, perhaps the difference between interaction itself, I like to point, perhaps the difference between interactive art and expository art 
can be compared to the difference between a Socratic dialogue and a lecture. A smart person can get up and stand in front of a bunch of people and yak, 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 and, you know, bestow pearls of wisdom upon the, the slobber, slobbering masses. But uh, far better to sit down with a student and work with a student, go back and forth and interact with the student and allow the student to ask questions, allow the student to make mistakes, and guide the student towards discovering the truth for himself. And that's always vastly more effective. The only reason we've gone for these mass expository forms of expression is because they're efficient. One artist can reach a million people with the you know mass media, but uh, that doesn't make it effective. It's far more effective to talk to people, to interact with them. And with computers, we can now be both effective and efficient. And that's what's important about the medium. On a, on a tangential side, directed to, to approaching that, well, there, there are two aspects here. The first is that, no, I haven't stayed in the games industry. I walked away from it 15 years ago, and I really uh, have made no effort to participate in it ever since. All of my participation has been at the request of somebody else. All the lectures, all the books I've written, all of that stuff comes from people approaching me and saying, Chris, will you tell us what you think about such and such? But I have not made any active inquiries or efforts in the games industry. This interactive storytelling stuff I'm doing, I don't regard it to be games at all. I think it's going to be a completely new medium. I think it's going to achieve some of the things that the interactive fiction people were aiming for. And it's certainly not going to reach the same market that the games people do the but the second the second aspect of the but the second the second aspect of your question is i think you're asking about why i'm still willing to write code and get my hands dirty with it i see that as being out on the edge it's uh uh you know it's kind of like zen in the art of motorcycle maintenance if you really want to do it right you've got to do it yourself I have to confess, though, that I'm having real difficulty keeping up with modern programming techniques. I was never a hotshot programmer. I was a game designer who learned how to program. And uh, in the early days, when programming was primitive, I could do as good a job as any other programmer. But nowadays, programming is a really professional activity. It requires vast expertise, and I simply don't have the time to keep up with it all, and so I'm able to write uh, preliminary code or prototype code. I am very fortunate in that I have two genuine programmers uh, assisting me, and they, they clean up the mess behind me. I don't know when you first kind of bumped into text adventure-like stuff. I don't know if you bumped 1979. into 1979. No, earlier. 77. Very first stuff, adventure. Do you yeah. remember having any thoughts about that when you bumped into it? Understanding it was 30 years ago. I was very impressed. And actually for me the, the, uh, the most exciting moment came when I uh, encountered a work by Rob Zadibble. Now, there's a name for you, spelled Z-D-Y-B-E-L. And he had, a uh, Rob, and he had uh, written an adventure game a generator, a tool, an editor you could use to write text adventures. It was very clever. It was one, one of the first, and uh, it was good. And I played around with it and did some stuff with it. And I was very impressed with the potential of that medium. And I was also enormously impressed with the potential for expansion of the medium. That is, he had slapped together something in basic in, in like a week's time. And I realized, my God, if you went to work with this thing and build a really good one, you could do all sorts of fabulous things. Um, it's just that at that time... 
the whole world was opening up. I mean, there were a million fabulous things that could be done with these personal computers, and uh, you couldn't do everything. I picked a number of things to pursue, but that, um, that sadly was one that I did not pursue. So, it's a shame. That, that sh was a very exciting time. Yeah, one of the things that you know, one of the things that strikes me about that era is that oh. I'd like to do that as opposed to anything else. Uh, board war games. I was an old board war gamer. You know, the big cardboard maps with the hexagons and all the little cardboard pieces. And I used to play that all through the 70s. And when microcomputers became available in the mid-70s, I realized, my God, this is the way to do it. Because microcomputers can solve one of the killer problems, which is called hidden uh, information or limited intelligence. In a real war, you don't know where the other guy's pieces are, but in a war game, you can look and see exactly where they all are. You know everything that's going to happen. Uh, and we needed a way to keep the information hidden. And I realized computers are the way to do it. And so that's what got me into it. I uh, built my own computer in 77 just so I could do this. And then I was programming war games on computers. I sold the first commercial computer war game uh, on uh, December 30th, 1978, I believe it was. And uh, that's what got me into it. But then once I got going at Atari, there were a million possibilities to follow. Um, 